This is Thomas Wayne Riley, and you have found yourself in the American Southwest. Two rules in life. I thought that there were two rules in life. Never count the cost, and never do anything unless you can do it wholeheartedly. Now is the time to live. Diary entry for June 11th, 1934. Everett Ruiz. This is part three of the four-part series over our adventurer and vagabond for beauty that is Everett Ruiz. If you haven't listened to the previous episodes, I suggest you do so before the intro music starts. And if you haven't done so already, a nice five-star review and some kind words on your app of choice would be very appreciated. Big things are coming for our humble little American Southwest podcast. So without any further delay, The Cult of Everett Ruiz. Beauty has always been my god. we discussed Everett, he had just left San Francisco after trying to make it as an artist and after his Sierra Nevada adventure. He didn't spend much time at home in Hollywood, though, before he was already rip-roaring and ready to get back on the lone trail in the four corners of the American Southwest. By April of 1934, Everett was 20 years old. His bags were packed, and he was about to embark on his grandest adventure so far, To begin, he hopped in a friend's car and hitched a ride to San Bernardino, where his older brother Waldo picked him up and the two headed to the American Southwest. But not before Everett said goodbye to his parents. Unbeknownst to any of them, it was to be their last goodbye. For this trip would be his last adventure. There is one anecdote from his month in L.A. that I should comment on before we jump into his final adventure. He wrote Waldo of what he was up to, and at one point he tells him that he had attended a young Communist League demonstration. I know, I know. But it was the 30s, during the Great Depression, and I forgive him. He doesn't buy into the propaganda anyways. But while he was at this meeting, the cops show up and break it, and they tear up the posters that read, We can't eat battleships, which is a good point. I mean, war is stupid. I'll give the commies that. But Everett writes how the cops kicked the girls in the legs and chased the boys with clubs down the street. He'd finish the story by writing, quote, Such a free speech and free assemblage in America. End quote. Something to ponder on 90 years later. Time does indeed seem to be a flat circle, as Nietzsche, Doctrine of Eternal Recurrence, suggests. After that letter... Waldo would agree to pick up Everett and take him to his favorite spots in the American Southwest. Despite Waldo's fears of his car not being able to make the trip, Everett would reassure him and say, No, 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 it totally can make it. The worst I've seen is a flat tire and an empty gas tank. Which is a very far cry from telling his parents not to pick him up because their car wouldn't make it. Remember that? Way back when in the first episode? Well, Waldo's fears were abated and the two would arrive in Cayenta, that Navajo town just south of Monument Valley. They would arrive on April 14th of 1934. Waldo would leave shortly after they arrived, not knowing he would never see his brother Everett again. Everett would write his parents about their adventure, quote, Waldo enjoyed his part of the trip very much, I think. I was sorry I could not show him more of the country, end quote. After Waldo departed... Everett would walk 18 miles and buy himself two burrows he'd name Leopard and Cocklebirds. He'd write 
The country here is all that I could wish it to be, and I am happy again. End quote. He and that land were becoming inseparable, and I know the feeling. He would indeed keep a journal on this trip, but it's with him somewhere out in the desert, or at the bottom of a river, or the abomination that is Lake Powell. Or maybe the aliens that abducted him took the journal with them. <laughs> or a local Escalante rancher's descendants still have it tucked away somewhere. So, just like way back in 1930 and 1931, all we really have of his writings are the letters he sent home and to his friends. And it's through those letters that we're able to piece together his last remaining months on this last grand adventure. Roberts writes of these letters that they are, quote, strikingly different from the ones he mailed to family and friends from the Sierra the previous year. They amount, in fact, to a kind of high-wire act, for as never before... In 1934, Everett strove to match the beauty of the landscape with beautiful crafted prose. The letters neglect the homely but concrete detail of daily life in favor of transcendent statements of spiritual belief, distilling the hard-won insights he had gleaned from his relentless vagabondage since the age of 16. End quote. Like most of his adventures, this one started out with a righteous mishap. But as he wrote to a Miss Emily Ormond, that's what it was all about. He'd write to her on May 2nd from Kayenta, and no, I don't know who she is. But he would write, quote, Wilhelmer Stephenson, the Arctic explorer, says that adventurers are a sign of unpreparedness and incompetence. End quote. I believe he is talking about misadventure, but he does continue. I think he is largely right. Nevertheless, I like adventure and enjoy taking chances when skill and fortitude play a part. If we never had any adventures, we would never know what stuff was in us. End quote. Right after he began this final adventure, he does in fact get to see what kind of stuff is in him as he was hit by a raging sandstorm. And it would cover his tracks in the Pink Monument Valley sand, and it made the going rather tough. After it passed, he would stop and paint Agatha Peak. It is rather worthy of painting, or as he put it, quote, It is a splendid rock with spires and pinnacles of black volcanic stone, end quote. He'd then look for an old Hogan, another five or six miles away, that he knew of to stay the night in. But once it was dark, both of his burrows, quote, bolted into the night. It was probably Leopard's idea, but Cockleburst took the cue instantly, and they were off like a shot, end quote. Despite hearing the saddlebags slapping against their beastly hides while he chased them down, his lungs were afire, and Everett could not catch them. And eventually, he lost the trail entirely. With no other choice, Everett found the sand-covered road from Monument Valley to Kayenta and took it into town. He would write of the affair, quote, I started to walk there to ask help of my Mormon friend, but a mile away, I turned about and went back. It was not that I couldn't stand being laughed at by the whole town, for it really was funny, and such things don't bother me, but it would be asking too much of the Mormon, and anyway, for a long time I had flattered myself that I could take it, and always had, without complaint, so I thought this was a good time to show myself. End quote. Good on him. Back near the Hogan he was going to use in the first place, he found two blankets that had been snagged by the fleeing burrows. He then made a fire, and he slept. To his bad luck, though, in the morning, it would rain on him. Yes, rain in the desert at Monument Valley. Seriously, just his luck. Everett would set out soon after sunrise to look for his two animals in the rain, which he would thankfully find. He'd write of them that Cockleburs was, quote, standing stock still, looking very foolish. Leopard was nearby, equally sheepish his saddle under him, but unhurt, end quote. In the end, all of his missing gear and tools were found, and the worst of the bad luck had been avoided. He would return to the Hogan with the two burrows and all his stuff, and he would get a blazing fire going, and he would feel, quote, perfectly delighted with everything, end quote. Two weeks went by, and Everett wrote Waldo that, quote, 
I had many other thrills when I trusted my life to crumbling sandstone and angles little short of the perpendicular and the search for water holes and cliff dwellings. Often I was surprised myself when I came out alive and on top. End quote. It seems the man was tempting fate at the regular nowadays. He would write something similar, but better, to a friend named Emily Ormond. Roberts elaborates further when he writes, quote, he repeated the formula almost verbatim to Emily Ormond, but added in his characteristic perfect tense a grandiloquent boast that has nonetheless become one of Everett's signature mottos. Now he's quoting Everett. I have seen almost more beauty than I can bear. End all quotes. I mean, that is a glorious line. I have seen almost more beauty than I can bear. But not, I hope it's not a feeling that he actually felt. Although his careless recklessness, this tempting of fate where he comes out, quote, alive and on top, he was possibly starting to think he would always come out alive and on top. He would write to Bill around this time period, quote, I have the devil's own conception of a perfect time. Adventure seems to beset me on all quarters, without my even searching for it, end quote. Now, that's another banger of a line. Seriously. Adventure seems to beset me on all quarters, without my even searching for it. In that same letter to Bill, he'd say further, And I'm lucky too, or have been, time and again, my life or all of my possessions have swung on the far side of the balance, and always thus far, I've come out on top and unharmed, even toughened by the chances I've taken. End quote. And then to another friend, around this same exact time period, this friend would be an Edward Gardner, Everett would write, quote, Day before yesterday, I narrowly escaped being gored to death by a wild bull, and there was a harrowing sequel when he discovered my camp that night, some while between midnight and dawn. Yesterday, I did some miraculous climbing on a nearly vertical cliff and escaped unscathed, too. One way and another, I have been flirting pretty heavily with death, the old clown, end quote. I wish we had more on this run-in with the bull, but alas, that is all the harrowing hints we get. It really does seem that Everett was truly tempting fate and laughing in the face of death on this last adventure of his, even more so than on his previous ones. And the key words there were last adventure, and I don't think he would learn to be any smarter anytime soon. As a matter of fact, as you're about to hear about, he's only going to get more reckless. Everett wouldn't spend long at Monument Valley, and by May 5th, he was southeast of Kayenta at a place known as Chilchen Bito. He told his parents it's Navajo for bitter water. I couldn't find out if that was true or not. As of today, in the year 2023, the town Chilchen Bito, it has the world's largest Navajo rug. Well, while he was there, Everett met a Hispanic trader named Jose Garcia, and the two would become instant friends. That we would just become best friends? Yep. This is what he would write about the Spaniard. Quote, when I came here last night, Jose's kindness and courtesy almost brought tears to my eyes, for there is something very fine about him, and I have not met many of his kind in this country. His father, a wizened old pioneer of the Spaniards, is here too. They are good, simple people without sophistication, living happily in this at present untroubled part of the world. Jose speaks four languages, English, Spanish, Navajo, and Zuni. End quote. With this new friendship kicking off, Everett offered to paint a triple tower of rock known as the Three Fingers for Garcia. Offering someone a free piece of art, that is a mark of a true friendship. While hanging out in the little town and painting for his new friend, Everett would comment on some of the nice sights he would see, namely the, quote, handsome lie, the young girls among the Navajos. Interestingly, there is a picture of Everett that has survived the test of time. Well, I mean, there are a few. But in this particular picture, he is standing next to a Navajo Hogan and a presumably Navajo woman who was holding a baby. And the caption of the photograph says, quote, my Navajo wife. Since it doesn't appear he wrote about her to anyone, she is most likely just an acquaintance and the photograph was for fun. But later speculation will incorporate this photo and its implications into his disappearance. Because remember, 
as of the year 2023, his remains are still undiscovered. Unfortunately, Everett's new Spanish best friend, Jose Garcia, in a freak accident, was killed when he was riding on the back of a fully loaded truck. It seems a wheel came off of the truck while it was driving, which caused the truck to topple, and when it fell over and rolled, the entire load crushed Jose and killed him. He was squashed, which is a horrifying end. As is the norm when these kind of horrible things happen, Everett reached out to someone he felt a real connection with. He would write Francis, that woman that we talked about in the last episode that he had a relationship with, however brief. After the accident, he would inform her of the death of his friend, but he would also comment on he and Francis's brief intimacy. He wrote, I do not know if I shall ever return to the cities again, but I cannot complain that I found them empty of beauty. End quote. After all that talk of hating the city, he found the one thing that can make him feel compelled to enjoy them and come back. I mean, I don't like Southern California. I mean, it's beautiful, but I don't like the cities. But I live here because I deeply love my wife, so I understand. After writing that to Francis, though, about finding the cities filled with beauty because of her, and the very next line, that's when he says the haunting quote that makes me shudder still. I'll repeat it because it is something. And I'll, I'll repeat it at the end, too, no doubt. I was sorry, though, that our intimacy, like many things that are and will be, had to die with a dying fall. End quote. He then goes on to tell her about the rest of his time in the American Southwest so far, including, quote, There has been deep peace, vast calm, and fury, strange comradeships and intimacies, and many times my life and all my possessions have tottered on the far side of the balance. End quote. He's really leaving less and less doubt about his ultimate fate. He closes the letter to her with, quote, But much as I love people, the most important thing to me is still the nearly unbearable beauty of what I see. I won't wish that you could see it, for you might not find it easy to bear either. But yet I do sincerely wish for you at least a little of the impossible. Love from Everett. End quote. After he sent off these letters, he wrote one more to Bill, which started, quote, Once more, I am roaring drunk with the lust of life and adventure and unbearable beauty. End quote. That reminds me of another of his writings, and this writing is in his journal, and it says, quote, I have been filled for three days with a dreamy intoxication from the serene beauty and perfect solitude. End quote. Everett would then set out on an epic 170-mile loop from Chilchinbido to Chinle, and he'd go through Canaan de Shea, and then to the Lucachucais and the Carrizos Mountains. The Lucachucais, these are the, they're the mountain range that are just southwest of the Four Corners in northern Arizona, in Navajo land. They're just west of Shiprock. And these mountains are filled with ruins, red rocks, and uranium ore. You will need a Navajo permit to explore the area, if you are interested. And yes, I am very interested. I have only ever driven through those mountains on that harrowing snow-filled night in April of 2017 that I described in the last episode or two ago. But the last time I drove near them, on the eastern edge of the Lukachukais on Highway 491. Last time I did that was in June of 2023, and I told my wife, I have to explore that wilderness. The last time I was there, though, when I was driving at night to Canyon de Chez, I truly feared that my truck would get stuck in a creek of melting snow. Uh, I needed to cross it, so I floored my gas pedal and dipped violently down the sand embankment, 
splashed and crashed and bumped through the muddy snowmelt creek before barely making it totally blind back up the other side of the creek, hoping all the while I wouldn't hit a tree on account of the road turning abruptly on the far side. My windshield and my headlights were coated and dark as spinning tires fishtailed me left and right through the moonlit night. But I came to a stop, clear and safe on the far side of the water flow. I leapt out the car, roared happily into the night, and thanked my lucky stars. I, mean, I think I even like Indian and Rebel yelled and hooped and hollered, and I fired a shot into the air, because that's what you do in the desert when something goes really well. Something goes, like, right. And the gunpowder and my breath lingered around on account of the cold alpine air and the total stillness of the windless night. And little did I know, it was not the last water crossing I would be doing in that isolated mountain range on the border of Arizona and New Mexico. Again, I did make it down, only to not see Spider Rock. I am still kicking myself for that. During this stint, though, Everett, after crossing the canyons and the Lukachukais, he'd head to the Carrizos, which are, apparently, I learned, small, circular volcanic mountains just north of the Lukachukais. I've never been to these mountains, nor have I ever really thought of them or maybe even noticed them. I mean, I've driven by them, but I guess I just didn't register. But now, I am curious to explore them as well. Roberts says they are, quote, still today one of the most unfrequented regions in all the Southwest, end quote. And obviously now I must go. Both are part of the larger Chuska Mountains, a place the Chacoans got over half of their timber from, especially after the year 1050. Since, like Everett, the journal for this seven-month adventure has been lost and not found. And since in his letters he grew less and less detailed the day by day and more philosophical and grandiose, we are left with only grasps and hints at what happened to him personally and physically. But in a long letter that Bud Rusho described as being one of the, quote, most sensitive, image-filled letters that Everett ever wrote, end quote, in that letter, Everett describes to Francis, this mysterious lover girl, Everett describes an amazing scene that, although long, it is absolutely beautiful and a scene that transports the reader directly to the landscape of that beautiful story. So the other night at twilight, unwilling to drown my consciousness in slumber and dissatisfied with life, I packed and saddled my burrows and left my camp by a rushing stream at the edge of the desert. The half moon had an orange glow as I rode on the trail up the mountains. Behind us, thunder boomed on the open desert and black clouds spread. Moaning winds swept down the canyon, bending the tops of the tall pines and firs, and clouds hid the moon. Silently, Old Cockleburrs, my saddle burrow, carried me upward through the night, and Leopard followed noiselessly with the pack. Grotesque shapes of trees reared themselves against the darkening sky, and disappeared into blackness as the trail turned. For a while, the northerly sky was clear, and stars shone brilliantly through the pine boughs. The darkness closed upon us, only to be rent by livid flashes of lightning and thunder that seemed to shake the earth. The wind blew no longer, and we traveled in an ominous, murky calm, occasionally slashed with lightning. Finally, the clouds broke, and rain spattered down as I put on my slicker. We halted under a tall pine, and my sombrero sheltered the glow of a cigarette. The burrows stood motionless with heads down and water dripping off their ears. In half an hour, the rain was over and the skies cleared. By moonlight, we climbed the rim of the mountain and looked over vast, silent stretches of desert. Miles away was the dim hulk of Shiprock, a ghostly galleon in a sea of sand. We turned northward on the nearly level top of the mountain and winding through glades of aspen, we came to three peaceful lakes, gleaming silver in the moonlight. 
Under a clump of low, sprawling oaks, we stopped. And there I unpacked, turning the burrows out to graze on the tall meadow grass. In the afternoon, I went for a long, leisurely ride on Leopard, skirting the edge of the mountain, riding through thickets of rustling aspen, past dark, mysterious lakes, quiet and lonely in the afternoon silence. Two friendly horses were belly deep in a pond, swishing their tails and placidly chewing rushes and swamp grass. Flowers nodded in the breeze, and wild ducks honked on the lakes. No human being came to disturb the brooding silence of the mountain. Last night I came down the mountain, and as the sunset glow faded, it was weird to see the orange moon seemingly falling down, down through the pine boughs as I descended. End quote. And that, uh, that's... I mean, doesn't the writing like make you want to go out and explore and find peace and see storms and watch wildflowers sway in the breeze? And oh, doesn't it make you want to hear thunder or the wind through tall pine trees? To watch the light flicker off a dark secret lake in the high desert mountains where a few folks follow the lack of a trail by only the dim moonlight. Author John Nichols, in the intro to A Vagabond for Beauty, writes of Everett, quote, Ultimately, it was his life that was his greatest work of art. End quote. Now, he couldn't be more right. And part of that is because of his greed for life, as Francis accused him of having. But as Everett himself said, quote, I don't like to let opportunities for living slip by ungrasped. End quote. Amen, partner. No more letters to Francis have emerged in the record. But here are some of his other writings from that time period of May 1934, if you'll indulge me. Then in wild whirling fury the storm rises boiling and seething until with a furious upward rush the whole horizon is submerged and it fills the air with swirling stinging blinding snow with this black dawn i perish i am drunk with the searing intoxication that liquor could never bring drunk with the fiery elixir of beauty i am condemned to feel the withering fire of beauty pouring into me I am condemned to the need of putting this fire outside myself and spreading it somewhere, somehow. And I am torn by the knowledge that what I have felt cannot be given to another. End quote. Now, if only I could have told him that you truly can share this with another. By the middle of June, Everett was back in Kayenta, his headquarters, essentially. And there he wrote that he would soon be heading off towards Navajo Mountain. Ah, Navajo Mountain. That place that seems so visible from so many different spots all over the Four Corners. I talked about that mountain briefly in the series over Dominguez Nescalante. But I'll briefly talk about it again. Or rather, I'll let David Roberts sum it up. Rising to a summit of 10,388 feet just north of the Arizona-Utah border, Navajo Mountain has long been a sacred location for the Diné. It stands, moreover, in what is still today one of the most remote regions of the southwest. The sharp, twisting canyons that crease the mountain's western and northern flanks are among the ruggedest in the United States. Near the mouth of one of those tributaries of the Colorado River, hidden in a bend of sandstone, looms Rainbow Bridge the largest natural geological span in the world, end quote. He also says of it, Roberts, also says of it in his Dominguez Nescalante book, that the mountain is, quote, one of the lordliest landmarks in the Four Corners region, end quote. Yet again, I have to mention John Wetherill, for he guided the first party of whites to the massive rainbow arch in 1909. He also built the Bridge Trail, which traverses the northern slopes of that sacred Navajo mountain. Roberts describes it as, quote, one of the most cunning horse-packing routes in the country, which traverses miles of slick rock slabs, end quote. 
some of the tourists that John Wetherill guided to the bridge were Teddy Roosevelt and the future episode star and historical bestseller and all-around extremely fascinating guy, author Zane Gray. My wife and I are currently collecting all of his books, although she's the one doing all the reading of them so far. I definitely need to get on that, especially before my episodes on him. I think at this point we have 18 Zane Gray novels and a couple biographies or a biography and then some of his own writings. Actually, I know we do. I just paused and went and checked. So Everett's plan was to go up to Monument Valley and then to the San Juan River before turning due west. He would climb No Man's Mesa and he would approach the mountain from that very rough and rugged, seldom trekked landscape. A landscape mostly off limits to us these days if you're not Navajo. I mean, you may be able to travel with a permit. I mean, I hope so. I, I want to travel it one day. In a letter Everett wrote to his buddy, who continually stands him up, his buddy Bill, he wrote, quote, Often, alone in an endless open desert, I find it hard to believe that the rest of the world exists. End quote. That's part of the draw of being there. You do forget that the rest of the world exists. I mean, the reason why I go out there sometimes is to forget the world. I just wish cell service wasn't creeping into every part of the wilderness. Soon there will be nowhere to hide, and when you look up in the night sky, all you'll see are satellites buzzing across slowly and obscuring the heavens. In that letter, Everett also said he had no desire to be a famous artist or writer any longer. Now that may be on account of his failings in San Francisco... Or the desert just brings this feeling out of him. Hopefully it was nothing like sinister that he was admitting. He'd also rail against the white traders of the region who seemingly want nothing more than money. They live in such a beautiful environment they don't even care to go visit it. He would also say one of his most oft-quoted lines when he wrote, quote, Beauty has always been my God. End quote. It is necessary scripture mastery for the cult members today, and the title of this episode. While in Cayenta, in between excursions, he also remarked in a letter that there was an archaeological dig in town, and some of the people he met turned out to be pretty decent, likable, and intelligent young fellows. He would leave for Navajo Mountain on June 17th. Only two letters and just... A couple pieces of a third letter exist from this adventure to that remote region. One of those letters was to Bill, and in it he describes a near disastrous accident while ascending 2,000 feet onto No Man's Mesa from the San Juan River. Near the rim, it was just a scramble, and Leopard, whom I was packing, in attempting to claw his way over a steep place, lost his balance and fell over backwards. He turned two backward somersaults and a side roll landing with his feet waving about six inches from the yawning gulf. I pulled him to his feet. He was a bit groggy at first. He had lost a little fur, and the pack was scratched. End quote. Whew. That would be a horrifying, heart-stopping sight to see, probably in slow motion. From that narrow escape... He somehow made it past Nokai and Paiute Canyons, which are places still barely traveled today. But no word survives of this daring jaunt that is filled with canyons where Navajos hid from Spaniards and Americans alike over the centuries. Everett did make it to the Navajo Mountain, though. At 8,700 feet up at a place known as War God Springs, he wrote a letter to Bill. He would write a few things I absolutely love. The wind is in the pine trees. What other sound is like it? He's right. That was a quote from him. Uh, he's right. It's, it's one of my favorite sounds. 
He also writes, The beauty of this place is perfect of its kind. I could ask for nothing more. A little spring trickles down under aspens and white fur. By day, the marshy hollow is a swarm with gorgeous butterflies. There are a hundred delightful places to sit and dream. Friendly rocks to lean against, springy beds of pine needles to lie on and look up at the sky or the tall, smooth tree trunks, with spirals of branches in their tuft foliage. End quote. This was late June, the 29th to be exact. So monsoon season hadn't quite started, so it was very difficult for him to get water, but he apparently never went more than two days without it. I mean, that, that is some tough living. Two days is still a long time for us water drinkers of the 21st century. He would go on to write, The perfection of this place is one reason why I distrust ever returning to the cities. Here I wander in beauty and perfection. There, one walks in the midst of ugliness and mistakes. Here, I take my belongings with me. The picturesque gear of packing and my gorgeous Navajo saddle blankets make a place of my own. But when I go, I leave no trace. End quote. I couldn't really find any hard evidence for this, but I would not be surprised if this exact quote is the origin of the leave no trace that the NPS and BLM and everyone uses today. I mean, maybe not. Again, I could find no evidence. But the next day, June 30th, 1934, Everett wrote to his parents. Uh, by now, he was one day away from Rainbow Bridge. Quote, The country between here and the San Juan and Colorado Rivers and beyond them is as rough and impenetrable a territory as I have ever seen. Thousands of domes and towers of sandstone lift their rounded pink tops from blue and purple shadows. To the east, great canyons seam the desert, cutting vermilion gashes through the gray-green of the sage-topped mesas. End quote. Three weeks would go by before Everett made it back to Cayenta. And when he got back to that small town, he began working for that archaeological crew. I mean, I'm kind of beginning to see Everett as the like 1930s version of Forrest Gump, except less annoying. For this archaeological expedition, he was officially their cook and their packer, like the burrow and horse packer. Unofficially, he was there to learn and admire and climb and paint. Roberts writes this of the archaeological dig, quote, The team outfitting in Cayenta was part of a massive multi-year project called the Rainbow Bridge Monument Valley Expedition. Between 1933 and 1938, researchers undertook an extensive survey of Anasazi ruins, ranging, as the title indicates, from Monument Valley through the Tsegi Canyon system and across the Rainbow Plateau to Rainbow Bridge, all in country that was part of the Navajo Reservation. The rationale for the project, run by the National Park Service, was to lay the groundwork for a new national park encompassing those scenic and cultural wonders. Had such a park come to it into existence, it would have torn out of the reservation some 3,000 square miles, or about one-eighth of its total area. End quote. Honestly, thank goodness that never happened. I mean, the only thing that could have benefited was maybe like Powell wouldn't have been made, but besides the loss of the Navajos of land they call theirs, Think of the trails and tourists and traffic and trash and roads. Think of all the roads. And posters and books and cheap souvenirs made overseas. Ugh, makes me shudder. It would have been a tragedy. <laughs> Thankfully, only Rainbow Bridge and Navajo National Monuments came out of it. And Navajo National Monument was barely visited. You need a ranger guide anyways. And Rainbow Bridge... I think is only accessible by boat, but but I th actually, you can get a permit from the Navajo Nation and walk there, I believe, on the Weather Road Trail. For this dig, Everett signed on to the 38-year-old Lyndon Hargrove's team. But Lyndon's boss was an H. Claiborne Clay Lockett. The director of it all was Ansel Hall, who was a Park Service archaeologist, Ansel had got his start at Yosemite as chief naturalist, 
and he spent almost all of his time before and after this in California. This was just a small jaunt out to the southwest for Ansel Hall. Everett called his boss Hargrove a, quote, grizzled young chap of 28, widely experienced and a magnificent humorist. He is an ethnologist and something of an artist as well, end quote. Also on the team was Ben Wetherill, John Wetherill's son. I do promise a Wetherill family episode in the future. Probably after I re-examine the ancient ones again. John, though, was missing an eye from a horse-kicking accident, although that would not stop him from being a lifelong adventurer. Apparently, he was also prone to melancholic mood swings, much like our Everett. Instead of paraphrasing and combining sources here, I'll just let David Roberts tell the story of this dig. In July 1934, Lockett's team had returned to Kayenta from the Tsegi Canyon system to resupply before tackling a remote cliff site they had discovered earlier in the summer. In Dobozibido Canyon, 600 feet above a well-known Anasazi ruin called Twin Caves Pueblo, just beneath the rim of Skeleton Mesa, the team had found a basket maker burial cave. The basket makers were the phase of Anasazi before 8750, who built not masoned room blocks such as their descendants specialized in, but underground pit houses and slab-lined storage cysts. That was also Roberts. Its discovery, as Lockett later wrote of the new ruin, was a result of a Sunday climb by some of the more daring members of the expedition who worked out two routes up the cliff to the cave. The more hazardous parts of both routes were found to have hand and toe holds packed into the cliff, evidence that the trails were used in prehistoric times. End quote. The Tsegi Canyon system, the same as Navajo National Monument and Betatakan and Kiet Seal, it is filled with ruins and what are called Mokwai steps, which is like Anasazi carved in steps. They named the site Woodchuck Cave, and Everett was one of those daring members that climbed the dangerous cliffside, no doubt. Although he wouldn't actually be listed as a member of the team on the final report, which was published 19 years later, after the dig. We do know, though, that he was there because of the many photographs of him with Hargrave, such as the one where they're forcing burrows at the scary carved incline that led the pack animals into and out of the canine system. Lockett would later comment of Everett's lack of caring about the archaeology side. But in letters to his parents and friends, Everett does a really good job talking about the basket makers and Pueblo eras. I mean, so, I mean, he was using archaeological jargon, so he must have retained something. On July 22nd, Everett would write his parents about this archaeological adventure. Quote, There is a very precarious way down the face of the cliff with footholds in the stone hundreds of years old. The only other way is the horse ladder six miles up the canyon. We came that way with pack burrows, passing the carcass of a horse that slipped. After two days of wandering on the mesa top in the trackless forests, we crossed the bare rock ledges in a heavy cloudburst and came here. End quote. He really can paint a picture. And a heavy cloudburst would be, you know, monsoon season. This woodchuck cave that they were digging was estimated to by the archaeologists to have been inhabited during the Basket Maker II period, which is, like Robert said, roughly 1200 BC to AD 500. And please, if you are interested in that kind of information, check out my whole series on the Ancient Ones, if you have not already. This archaeological team figured it was around AD 200 when the structures were built and occupied. Maybe as Everett wrote his parents, 500... The archaeologists then found in Woodchuck Cave animal bones, pieces of woven baskets, yucca sandals. Man, I would love to find some yucca sandals. They found wooden dice. And, the most exciting find, the remains, both whole and partial, of 20 individuals. Seven of them were infants. And some of these 20 were mummified from the desert's aridity. 
Now, I can't imagine myself. I can indeed imagine what finding human remains is like since I have been a part of a team which did just that in the Maya jungles of Belize. It surprisingly wasn't as creepy as one would think. Although after breaking one of the leg bones, <laughs> uh, not mine, but breaking one of the skeleton leg bones on my descent into the man-made cave that represented the Maya Shibalba, or their underworld, after breaking the leg bone of this 1,000-year-old man, I did contract malaria and almost died, like two days later. What would have creeped me out in Belize, though, is if the heads of the dead we discovered were missing. Because you see, in Woodchuck Cave, every adult body was missing its head. They'd all been beheaded, and their skulls were nowhere to be found. I personally don't know what to make of that, and neither did these archaeologists or researchers, but they did make the comment that the cave had been ransacked later, especially and specifically for bones. So it seems maybe later on Asazi came by and took the bones? I mean, jewelry and other grave goods hadn't been taken. But the skulls and some long leg bones had been confiscated. The researchers figured the cave had been very specially looted by later American Indians, not by Anglos. I personally, I have no idea what to make of that, although I do have my suspicions. During the dig, Everett was paid only in meals, but he seems to absolutely have loved the experience. He wrote his parents, quote, we have great fun up here by ourselves, discovering something new every day and looking out over everything from our sheltered cave. End quote. Much like the Anasazi used to do, I imagine. I mean, when they weren't looking out for the enemy who would come and eat them or burn them alive. In 1982, Bud Rusho, the author of A Vagabond for Beauty, he tracked down Lockett, the archaeologist the man in charge of the team. And Russo interviewed him to see if he remembered Everett. And Russo had this to say of the interview. Everett did not impress Lockett with his interest in archaeology, for Rubis spent most of his free time, which was considerable, in gazing out over the landscape. Lockett noticed also that Everett seemed careless about his safety when climbing around cliffs. Citing as an example the time Everett wanted to make a watercolor sketch of rain-spawned waterfalls shooting off from several points. According to Lockett, Everett nearly got himself killed finding a vantage point on the wet, slick rock. Needless to say, the rain-streaked watercolor sketch was not one of his better efforts. End quote. Could this be a clue to his disappearance? These clues do seem to be piling up. And we are nearing the end of his exciting life. That being said, Roberts does hint that maybe the sort of painter that was Lockett, who, by the way, would eventually abandon archaeology and he would become the head of the Museum of Northern Arizona's gift shop. Maybe Lockett was envious of Everett's painting ability. Or ever its ability to just wander around life as he pleases without a care in the world. It could also be that Lockett knows that Everett died, and he died possibly by a fall or some accident, so Lockett saw his actions, Everett's actions back then, as being a prelude to the future. So he saw kind of like the reality of what happened distorting the reality of what he had witnessed happening. Like, maybe Everett wasn't as dangerous as Lockett is suggesting, but his mind has made it like, made it that way in the interim after he found out that Everett died. Either way, Everett does indeed seem to revel in retelling to his friends and his brother how dangerous his adventures can be and were increasingly becoming. Take, for instance, the letters he would send shortly after this archaeological dig. Some of the stories he writes state, quote, I have seen more wild country than on any previous trip. I almost lost one burrow in the quicksands. He was in up to his neck. End quote. In another, he wrote, quote, In my wanderings this year, I have taken more chances and had more and wilder adventures than ever before. 
and what magnificent country I have seen. End quote. With that daringness was coming experiences that truly made him feel alive. He'd write, quote, Though not all my days are as wild as this, each one holds its surprises, and I have seen almost more beauty than I can bear. End quote. Well, I do wish we had that journal. And I kind of wish I could just get up right now out of this seat, stop recording, and go to the Colorado Plateau. From this awesome dig, I am infinitely jealous of Everett being able to participate in, from the Tsegi Canyons, Everett travels south towards the Hopi Mesas once again. If you'll remember, Everett did visit them in 1931, and on that trip he had not been impressed, so he wanted to redo. This time, maybe because he had matured a little, on this visit to the Hopis he'd find it incredibly valuable. He even got to witness some of the Hopi dances, including the snake dance. What a sight it must have been. Most of these dances are closed to outsiders today, but in the 1930s, the Hopis were much more welcoming to people witnessing the spectacles, or I guess not spectacles, but rituals. And that's probably because so few came to attend. I imagined part of the reason why they're closed now is because they would be flooded with tourists who would be clamoring to view the dances and filming them and putting them everywhere on social media. And that would be a nightmare. They would need facilities and tickets and parking and and anyways. Everett got to witness some of these awesome dances in August of 1934 in Hotevilla, which is on the third Hopi Mesa. Author David Roberts has this to say of his time there in this town of Hotevilla. Everett did not write home again until August 25th. The day before, he had watched the snake dance in Hotevilla, a village on the third mesa that had been founded in 1907 by a group of natives who had seceded from Oraibi, resolving a religious schism that had threatened to tear apart what is often called the oldest continuously inhabited settlement in the United States. Hotevilla was thus one of the more progressive Hopi towns, in which Everett seemed to have been openly accepted as a guest. Quote, I have been having great fun with the Hopis here, he wrote his parents, and just finished a painting of the village. The children were clustered all around me, some helping and some hindering. End all quotes. So, Everett then even got to participate in the antelope dance at Mishong Novi on Second Mesa. He would write to his parents, quote, My Hopi friends painted me up and had me in their antelope dance. I was the only white person there. End quote. Uh, that, that is quite the honor. And maybe he didn't understand how much of an honor that was, but uh, I really wish we had that journal. From Hopi Land, Everett was then off to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. He's basically just the Energizer Bunny mixed with Forrest Gump. By September 9th, he was at the Desert View Tower area of that national park. Unfortunately, though, while he was traveling from the mesas to the Grand Canyon, he was following the Little Colorado River, where he lost Leopard, the burrow, with some of his pack. Lost as in Leopard died. But that's all we know. Uh, I'm assuming he fell into the river. But Everett would quickly find a replacement with a bigger burrow. Everett named this burrow Chocolate, but he would later change it to the more appropriate, in my opinion, Chocolatero. He would tell his parents in a letter that Chocolatero is, quote, young, strong, and good-natured, inexperienced, but bound to learn from his experienced comrade, end quote. The burrows really are characters in this story in their own right. Everett's stay at the Grand Canyon is a complete mystery, but we do know he went and visited Lockett, the very same archaeologist who had led the team. Everett would head down to Flagstaff and hang out with Lockett and his wife for a week or so before Lockett's wife jested that, quote, either he goes or I do, end quote. That's on account of Everett's voracious appetite, apparently. Everett would check out some ruins upon Lockett's request, command, his wife's command. While exploring ruins and the San Francisco peaks, Everett would write to his mother a beautiful line about the autumn mountains, which I will quote from. 
The San Francisco peaks soar high in the afternoon sunlight. The slopes are golden with yellowing aspen. Love from Everett. He'd quickly return to the Lockett couple, giving each of them a book. Lockett would later suggest to Bud Russo in the 80s that Everett was just a quote-unquote free spirit who, quote, loved the Navajos and everybody, loved animals, burrows, dogs, kids, and everything, end quote. He'd shortly thereafter, Everett would, shortly thereafter return to the Desert View Tower at uh, Grand Canyon. And it is there, speaking of the Navajos, that he loves so much, it is there at the Desert View Tower he receives a letter from one of the high school friends he had climbed Mount Whitney in California with. In his response to his friend's letter, Everett would write, quote, Evidently, you overheard something of my adventures with my friends, the Indians. I have a great time with them, especially the Navajos. I once spent three days far up in a desert canyon, assisting in watching a Navajo sing for a sick woman. I drove away countless hordes of evil spirits. But after I went away, the girl died. The sand paintings, seldom seen by white men, were gorgeous. In my wanderings this year, I have taken more chances and had more wild adventures than ever before. And what magnificent country I have seen. Wild, tremendous wasteland stretches, lost mesas, blue mountains rearing upward from the vermilion sands of the desert, canyons five feet wide at the bottom and hundreds of feet deep, cloudbursts roaring down unnamed canyons and hundreds of houses of the cliff dwellers abandoned a thousand years ago. End quote. Man. This is like the most inspiring episode I've done yet. Because I just want to be out there right now. We have no idea where this event with the sick girl, Navajo girl, happened. But it is quite the experience for a white man in the 1930s to have. Or, I mean, I guess any white man ever to have. Roberts says this of the whole affair. Quote. There is no evidence that Everett ever made up imaginary adventures to regale his friends and family with. He may have exaggerated here and there, but he had no trace of the liar about him, or even the spinner of tall tales. Yet this Navajo scenario is so unusual that it must bespeak a profound trust that Everett had won from natives somewhere in Arizona. For a traditional family, and any Navajos living far up in a desert canyon were traditional, to let an Anglo see the sand paintings that a medicine man would have composed on the ground and then effaced shortly after they were finished would have been extraordinary. And to let that Anglo not only attend but participate in a sing intended to cure a fatally ill woman would have been even more extraordinary. End quote. So again, as of 2023, we have not found Everett's remains. But... As you'll see in the next episode, and final episode, there's lots of rumors that he joined the Navajos. Could he have gained that much trust? From the Grand Canyon, Everett went, well, we don't know. It's now mid-October, so it's too cold to be hanging out up there. But Bud Rusho and Vagabond guesses that he actually heads north, and he crosses the Colorado near uh, Lee's Ferry. That place that almost killed the DNA expedition that I talk about in that series. And from there, Everett makes his way to Brass Canyon, where it's also very cold in the winter. Rusho comes to this conclusion on account of Everett's return address on a letter he sent to his parents, so it seems legit. In these letters of the past few months, he was actually suggesting, and then almost demanding, in a about face from his previous adventures, he was demanding that his parents stop sending him money because his paintings were beginning to actually sell, maybe. I mean, he could have finally made it as an artist after all in southern Utah or northern Arizona. Once at Brass Canyon, Everett befriended the chief ranger, a Maurice Cope. So we do know that he was at Brass Canyon. Everett would write to his mother about the hoodoos and the landscape of Bryce and say, quote, I enjoyed riding down from Bryce Canyon through the grotesque and colorful formations. Mother would surely enjoy the trees. 
They are fascinating, especially the twisted little pines and junipers. I had never seen the foxtail pine before. It is a ridiculous caricature of a tree, with gangling limbs and most amusing foxtails lopping about in all directions, with no symmetry at all. There is a natural bridge called Tower Bridge. End quote. Yes, there is. I have seen it. He then suggested that he was going to head towards the most intriguing and one of my favorite places in the world, a place near the Kaipirowitz Plateau, a place near the Straight Cliffs or Fifty Mile Mountain, Hole in the Rock Road. He was headed towards the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, although of course it wasn't called that quite yet. After leaving Bryce, Everett sent a long letter to his parents from Tropic, the town just south of the park and down the mountains. Maurice Cope, the head ranger, and a Mormon, invited Everett to stay with he, his wife, and his nine children in that little Mormon farming town of Tropic. Russia would comment that with nine kids, Everett could hardly have been a burden. In this first long letter he wrote about hanging out with the children, scouring the hills for a lost cow, gathering delicious apples from the orchards, and having apple fights. No doubt, charming the girls, and even going to a Mormon church. He wrote of the service, quote, It was an interesting experience. End quote. From Tropic, he no doubt passed through the other Mormon farming communities of Canaanville and Henryville, where one must pass through to get to Kodachrome Basin State Park. He was essentially traveling on my favorite road in the whole world, Scenic Byway and State Highway 12 in Utah. For incredible pictures, videos, and history of that road and the places nearby, head to my website and check out the page on State Highway 12. A link will be on the page for this episode. To counter that possible and easiest to pass that he took Highway 12, it's possible he also just wandered through the area north of the highway in the blue hills and rugged terrain. At least, that's what he told his parents he did. But eventually he would indeed reach Escalante, or no, I apologize, Escalante, as the locals call it. And these locals would be the last people to see Everett alive. That year... 1934, Escalante, or Escalante, had actually had the worst drought in 80 years, and then a successive invasion of grasshoppers and locusts. Actually, quick side note about locusts. Locusts are just furious and hungry grasshoppers who change their entire form when supplies are low. They like morph into from grasshoppers to locusts. The entire species in a given area hulks out and destroys everything it sees in a frenzy to eat. It's fascinating and horrifying. Roberts sums up his stay there nicely when he wrote, quote, In Escalante, Everett camped beside the river, rode horseback with the local boys, hunted for arrowheads with them, and treated the boys to his campfire dinner of venison and potatoes. With the ranchers, he discussed his plans for the coming weeks, maintaining his insouciant poise in the face of their skepticism. On his last night in town, he took several of the boys to the movie theater. The next day, as he rode away down the Hole in the Rock Trail, he left everyone who had met him in Escalante with indelible memories of his brief visit. End quote. Roberts actually opens his book with interviews from the locals who were still alive about the last time they saw Everett. And here are some of the, the quotes. They're really good. Another Escalante native, Melvin Alvey, was 26 years old that autumn. Decades later, standing in the front room of the house, which he had lived all his life, Alvey pointed out the window. I talked to Everett over there in the street as he was leaving town, he recalled. He had these two little burrows. They didn't stand that high. Alvey flattened his palm four feet above the rug. I don't think either of them had 50 pounds loaded on them. I looked at those two little burrows going out in November. He never even had a tent. Didn't have a good camp stove. Alvey tilted his head back, summoning memories. He said he was going to go down in the desert and stay six weeks. Claimed he was going to be an artist and write stories. He didn't have enough for one week, let alone six, I said. It looks like you're traveling pretty light. Yes, he said. I don't need much. End quote. 
Another, a six-year-old Arnold Alvey, Melvin's nephew, said, quote, He came to our place on the outskirts of town. I was standing out there by the well. Here come this young guy with a couple of little gray burrows. I'd never seen burrows before. He said, Could I water my burrows in your trough? I said, Sure. He had on a floppy hat, a light-colored orange shirt that fluttered in the breeze. He had quite high cheekbones and quite a nice-looking guy. Said he was going down in the desert to spend the winter. I can see it like it was yesterday. Last night he was here, Norm Christensen recounted. He took some of us kids to the picture show. It was called Death Takes a Holiday. Probably cost ten cents. Everett treated us. Christensen shook his head. I still remember him waving next morning as he passed on down the river. I've thought about him quite a bit over the years, Melvin Alvey confessed. Whenever it gets cold, to go down there and draw as an artist in November, when he only got three, four hours of decent weather in the day, I think he had some plans that nobody knew. End all quotes. That line, you know, he had plans that nobody knew, it kind of sends chills down my spine. It kind of chokes me up a little bit. And the movie Death Takes a Holiday. Not this time, not with Everett. And I'm still not sure what happened to him, but maybe it's true he did have some plans. Maybe the only adventure he could look forward to was the next great one. But we'll talk about that in the next episode. In the last letters he wrote home, Everett included a painting he wanted to hang in his room in L.A. upon his return. So maybe he didn't have plans. See, we'll get, un- we'll get into all this next episode. But Everett sent that painting to his parents, and he also implored them to please, for real, stop sending money orders. And in fact, he sent them money in his final letter to them. Ten dollars to be exact. And he paid for the kids' movies. He then told his parents he was well on his way to making his first million. Only if money's a thing in heaven, brother. Also in that letter, he outlined his future plans. Future plans that searchers for the man would dissect in detail for years to come. In this letter, he wrote, quote, I am going south towards the Colorado River now, through some rather wild country. I am not sure yet whether I will go across Smoky Mountain to Lee's Ferry and south, or whether I will try and cross the river above the San Juan. The water is very low this year. I might even come back through Boulder. So I may not have a post office for a couple months. I am taking an ample supply of food with me. End quote. So he means Boulder, Utah, not Colorado. And when I told people I eloped in a slot canyon just outside of Boulder... Nearly everyone assumes, I mean the big Colorado city, but no, I mean the small and beautiful little Mormon ranching and farming town just at the end of the Burr Trail, below the Boulder Mountains of Utah, on that amazing Highway 12. Boulder is a place that I will never forget, and it will forever be special to my wife and I, and a place I plan on visiting every year until I join Everett in the next great adventure, which hopefully is a long way from now. In his letter to Waldo at this same time, he actually summarized a lot of what he'd been up to, which is great for us. I love this letter, so I'm going to quote from it extensively. Since I left Desert View, a riot of adventures and curious experiences have befallen me. To remember back, I have to think of hundreds of miles of trails through deserts and canyons, under vermilion cliffs and through dense, nearly impenetrable forests, As my mind traverses that distance, it goes through a long list of personalities, too. But I think I have not written you since I was in the Navajo country, and the strange times I had there and in the sun-swept mesas of the Hopis would stagger me if I tried to convey them. I think there is much in everyone's life that no one else can understand or even appreciate. End quote. About that last part, he's absolutely right. There is so much in one's life that they can experience that no one else can understand or appreciate. And that's why I'm glad I have such an amazing adventure partner now to always experience them with me going forward. I think if Everett had lived a little longer, or a lot longer, he too would have found himself a perfect adventure partner, and he would have raised amazing adventures himself. 
I think his father would have been proud at the PG he became, or a perfect gentleman. And it seems like he almost, just almost found himself that partner. In that letter to Waldo, Everett says, quote, I stopped a few days in a little Mormon town and indulged myself in family life, church going and dances. If I had stayed any longer, I would have fallen in love with a Mormon girl. But I think it's a good thing I didn't. I've become a little too different from most of the rest of the world. End quote. So we're not sure who that Mormon girl is, but the cult of Everett Ruiz sure did try and track her down, but to no avail. Then Everett goes on to dispute my claim about him being happy with the wife when he wrote, quote, I don't think I could ever settle down. I have known too much of the depths of life already, and I would prefer anything to an anticlimax. That is one reason why I do not wish to return to the cities. This has been a full, rich year. I have left no strange or delightful thing undone that I wanted to do. End quote. All right, so maybe he wasn't yet mature enough to want to share his life with anyone else. I know I wasn't until I met my wife at 33 years old. I, too, left no strange or delightful thing undone that I had wanted to do. About the city part, though, that I can 100% endorse. Cities are not the way in which humans should be living, in my occasionally wrong opinion, but I'm not wrong this time. We cannot really live without cities these days either, so it's, you know. Maybe Everett knew he couldn't hide away forever, though. Here's one more long quote from this letter to Waldo that I love. As to when I shall visit civilization, it will not be soon, I think. I am not tired of the wilderness. Rather, I enjoy its beauty and the vagrant life I lead more keenly all the time. I prefer the saddle to the streetcar and star-sprinkled sky to a roof. The obscure and difficult trail leading into the unknown to any paved highway, and the deep peace of the wild to the discontent bred by cities. A few days ago, I rode into the red rocks and sandy desert again, and it was like coming home again. I even met a couple of wandering Navajos, and we stayed up most of the night talking, eating roast mutton with black coffee and singing songs. The songs of the Navajos express for me something that no other songs do. And now that I know enough of it, it is a real delight to speak in another language. I have not seen a human being or any wildlife but squirrels or birds for two or three days. Yesterday was a loss as far as travel was concerned, for I got into an impasse in the head of a canyon system and had to return almost to where I started. Last night I camped under tall pines by a stream that flowed under a towering orange-yellow cliff like a wall against the sky dwarfing the twisted pines on its summit and the tall straight ones that grew apart way up the face of it. It was glorious at sunrise. Today I have ridden over miles of rough country, forcing my way through tall sage and stubborn oak brush and driving the burrows down canyon slopes so steep that they could hardly keep from falling. At last I found a trail and have just left it to make dry camp on what seems like the rim of the world. End quote. He would finish this letter with the haunting sentence that states, quote, It may be a month or two before I have a post office, for I am exploring southward to the Colorado, where no one lives. End quote. From Escalante, Everett would travel southeast through what the locals simply called the desert, but what is today known as Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. The area was designated that in 1996 by the then tyrant or president of the United States, and it encompassed a whopping 1,870,000 acres, which is quite the enormous land grab by the federal government. Although they did just seize like a million acres near the Grand Canyon. Anyways, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument includes plenty of slot canyons, including the one I eloped in, but many others with names like Spooky, Peekaboo, Egypt. There is the absolutely amazing Calf Creek Falls, which my wife and I saw in March of 2023. It was quite cold that day, and there was a good bit of snow on top of the canyons, which made the falls rather full. 
we got to enjoy the view completely alone for quite some time. Also, in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, there are tons of ruins within the boundaries. There are arches like Grossrunner Arch. There are natural bridges, petrified wood, fossils, mummies, cliffs, canyons, backcountry byways, and seemingly infinite Colorado Plateau deserts and creeks and rivers that flow through the area. Plus, it's got the amazing hole in the rock road, which sports even more slot canyons and sandstone landscapes, including the demonic-shaped sandstone spires with gorgeous backdrops that is known as the Devil's Garden. And all of these places will be up on the website for this, on the page for this episode. The Hole in the Rock Road is 62 miles one way from Escalante until it hits the Colorado River. It's called that because Hole in the Rock, because Mormon pioneers looking for a route through this rough and rugged canyon filled terrain in 1879-1880, they blasted a hole in the rock with dynamite and pickaxes before lowering their ox and mule train down to the Colorado River. That's some engineering marvel. They then forwarded across what is now Glen Canyon National Recreation Area and that big old dirty river. It was pretty impressive. I absolutely love that road. I love this whole spot, this whole entire monument. Despite the empirical overreach by Washington in securing it. Well, this is wherever it was heading. This was the landscape that would swallow him whole forever. Or at least his physical being. Because the cult, I think, has kept him alive ever since. And I'm doing my part. Roberts says this of Everett's final known moments. Quote, A week later, more than 50 miles down the Hole in the Rock Trail, Everett bumped into the sheep herders Adlin Lay and Clayton Porter. For two nights, he shared their camp near the head of Soda Gulch. On the morning of November 21st, as Everett prepared to push on, the men offered him a quarter of mutton, which he declined, telling them he had plenty of food. They watched as he ambled away to the southeast with his burros, cockleburs, and chocolatero. As far as we know, which is not nearly far enough, that was the last time anyone ever saw Everett Ruiz. End quote. A ballad from the point of view of the two lonely burros, cockleburs, and chocolatero, was written by a family friend and journalist named Paul Wilhelm. And it ends this way, quote, At winter dusk they stand and wait, two burrows by a broken gate. But that was long before we knew that he corralled the burrows too, shoved in the grass and water near, enough to keep them for a year. He'd be away. Oh, not as long as you could bray, he said. Your song just round the bend up scarped pine belt. A cliff cave hangs where Indians dwelt. Now wait for me, I'll not be long. He swung away and sang his song. Say that I starved, was lost, or some cold starlit trail agleam, but that I kept my desert dream. And every winter dusk they wait, two burrows by a broken gate. For one who was there, trail friend, but vanished round the canyon bend. When autumn snows swirled off plateaus, where Escalante River flows. End quote. After all, the lone trail is best. I hope I'll be able to buy good horses and a better saddle. I'll never stop wandering. And when the time comes to die, I'll find the wildest, loneliest, most desolate spot there is. I didn't name this series The Cult of Everett Ruiz only to stop recording when he disappears. There's still a good amount of the mystery and story left. In the next episode, which will be the longest in the series, we will follow the heartbreak and questions that plague his disappearance as his family and friends search for him in vain. And the search will go on to this very day, from 1934 until now. And it will continue. But the next episode will be so much more than that. And I cannot wait for y'all to hear it as we will conclude, well, my telling of the story of Everett Ruiz. I'll see y'all again soon, 
in the American Southwest.